everybody. Welcome to our webinar today, Micro Heat Pumps, Window, Portable, and Saddleback. I'm Joe Wachunas uh, here uh, with Electrify Now, always with my teammate, Brian Stewart, and really excited to have Christopher Diamond, who we'll introduce in just a second. Hey, thanks, Joe. Yeah, you know, you might remember that we did a, a webinar a while ago on portable heat pumps. It's actually one of our most popular ones in terms of our YouTube views. Um, that's the unit in the center there. Um, and if you're curious about that, we'll put the link to it in the chat. But today we're talking about all three types of what we're calling micro heat pumps. Actually, that's Christopher Diamond's term, but we like it. And you can find these as window mounted units or the portables like we talked about, which roll around and are connected to the your window, go through your window with a, a hose and a window kit or what's called saddlebag, the one over here on the right, where they basically straddle the, the ledge of your window. And so the window can mostly close, which are pretty nice um, from a convenience standpoint. So we'll be talking about all three of these. But, you know, the reason why this is interesting is it's relatively new classification of product, not a lot of good information out about them, but you might be interested in them because pot potentially you want to reduce your use of expensive baseboard heat or other heating sources. Potentially, you're just looking to improve comfort in one of your room, maybe rooms, maybe it's not well served by your central system, or, or maybe you're just really interested in heat pumps and you're not ready to go all in on a ducted or ductless system yet, and you just want to try it out with these relatively inexpensive, on easy to access units. So whatever your motivation, these um, devices are pretty amazing. They're often really prioritized for cooling, which they do really well, but offer the additional benefit of adding some supplemental heat, which we will talk more about. And we have the perfect guest today to help um, unpack all this for us. We're gonna be joined by Christopher Diamond from NIA, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. And Christopher is the Senior Product Manager for Residential HVAC at NIA. And he's basically working to identify and evaluate new technologies that will result in substantial energy savings for the Northwest Electric Utilities and also uh, our customer, electric utility customers. And then meaningfully, he's really working to transform markets to, to make adoption of these new technologies faster and uh, uh, more widespread. He's focused on air source heat pumps, high performance new residential construction, manufactured homes, and super efficient appliances, demand response, and renewable energy integration. So he's kind of the perfect guest for us today. And I'm going to turn it over to him to lead us into this uh, topic of micro heat pumps. Welcome, Great. Christopher. Thank you, Brian. Welcome back, I should say, since we've had you on our program before. Thank you, Joe. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. And I want to do that one there. All right, it's coming through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to share with everybody a little bit of the research we've been doing at NIA. Um, and sort of what I've been following for a couple of years is this emergence of what I'm calling micro heat pumps, but it's really um, a definition that I use, not necessarily that anybody else in the industry really does. Before I dive into all that, I just want to let people know a little bit about NIA. NIA is an alliance of utilities and energy efficiency organizations that have worked together for more than 25 years to enact permanent market changes that drive energy efficiency and benefit the 13 million energy con uh, consumers in the Northwest. And I have to say as a disclaimer, the contents of this presentation do not in any way endorse Electrify Now. And the information presented here is informative about the technology solutions that provide improved energy efficiency. And just a little bit about, you know, who the, who NIA is, you know, we're um, a nonprofit funded by the roughly 140 Northwest electric and gas utilities. We have a staff of about 90 or a nonprofit. Most of the staff are in the Portland area, but we have a lot of contractors throughout the Northwest area. And we really work on stimulating um, innovation, improved delivery in the pipeline and more efficient energy technologies. We influence markets and by increasing availability of these emerging technologies and what we call market transformation, which is really removing barriers that, that a particular product might experience as it's entering or offering new value in terms of energy efficiency. And we really work on supporting the dialogue between our, our member funders. Um, and we also are involved in collecting data in terms of 
um, stock assessments of what's actually out there and being used, how much energy they're used, and provide that information broadly, not just to the Northwest, but nationally as well. All right, enough of the boilerplate NIA stuff. Let's talk a little bit of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover a little bit about what is a microheat pump. We did a field study that I'll share a little bit about. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the ratings and potential tax credits that might emerge for this new class of product and kind of what's in the way and what's coming down the, the pike. So first off, what is a microheat pump? In a, a, simplistically, I, I needed a term that described it things that plug into a standard electrical outlet. They, uh, they're they inverter driven, they're package systems, they're easy to install, they're by definition because you're plugging into an outlet, pretty small capacity, 9,000 to 12,000 BTUs an hour, whereas an electric heater is maybe 4,900 BTUs per hour. So they're twice the output for the same electricity. And they come in a bunch of different sh shapes and sizes, the sort of classic window shaker, portable, as well as the saddlebag design that's being developed and, and being brought to market in the next years. Um, they're kind of core value proposition that what's available today are these reverse cycle window air conditioners. They look like air conditioners, but like any good heat pump, they can move heat from outdoors to indoors or from indoors to outdoors. Um, so that's the nature of a heat pump. It's a, it's a basically a bi-directional air conditioner. And the current ones are on the market. They only actually operate when the outdoor temperature and heating mode, at least, they don't, they, they only work as a heater when the outdoor temperature is above 40 degrees. So typically 41 or better. They cost any order of five, six, seven hundred dollars come in a couple of different primary packages that you see here. They're a little difficult to identify in the marketplace because they are sold as air conditioners with heat pump or with reverse cycle. So it can be sometimes challenging to know what you're really looking at. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Oh, and I want to point out that when you look at these, these portable units, there are ones with two hose or a, a hose in hose kind of design or one with a singular hose. And it's important to look for the ones that have dual hose, principally because if you only have one, that means you're going to be sucking heat out of your house um, to heat the house. And it's sort of limited value. It will heat the room it's in, but it might actually also bring in more cool air from the outdoor in. So if you're trying to do heating with these things, or even cooling for that matter, having something that's dual, dual hose is going to be pretty important to performance. So the future ones, the ones we're kind of intrigued by, um, are a little bit larger physically in size, sometimes quite a bit larger. But the core is that they can operate in heating mode, not just to 41 degrees Fahrenheit, but way down, some below zero degrees Fahrenheit, still pulling heat out of the outdoor air and bring it into your house. And you, you might ask, how do you how do you pull heat out of cold air? Well, the same way that your ice box pulls heat out of um, that cold box in your refrigerator, your freezer, it uses a refrigerant to um, present a very cold coil outside. Heat moves into that. And then the compression cycle of the refrigerant then concentrates that heat and delivers it into the indoors. Most of these systems we're going to see are going to cost in the three to four thousand dollars. So really, when you look at them in their size and their design in terms of what they're capable of, they are really a lot more like ductless heat pumps, just laid out in a different configuration. They're like a low-cost single-room ductless heat pump that's a DIY. So that puts some unique sort of limitations on what they could do for you, but it also opens up a whole new market for the extra room or you need a little supplemental heat. Really intriguing value proposition beyond just an air conditioner. Christopher, while you're on that slide uh, before, Susan was just asking if, uh, if we wanted to talk at all about the companies uh, that are currently making these, or is that going to come out later? 
No, that's a good point. I don't mind sharing. These three different manufacturers that I've got shown their products are um, Gree on the left, Mydea in the center, and Gradient on the right. Um, the uh, the ones on the right, the, the Mydea and the Gradient, have uh, been awarded the uh, State of New York's uh, Coal Climate Window Air Conditioner Challenge, and they'll be having these installed and tested in lots of um, New York housing facilities in the next year. Um, and hopefully going from that to large scale. The one on the left, GRI, is still, I would call it development. It's really close, but I can't tell you date, time, price, or anything of that nature. I have seen the specs on it. Um, as you can tell, the the right two ones are saddlebag design and the one on the left there looks like more traditional window air conditioner sh shape, if you will. Um, if these are successful, I anticipate other manufacturers bringing products to the market as well. Are there any other questions? I was sort of wanting to pause and just hold here before I dive into our study. Are there any general questions? I can't see the questions list there. Joe, so go ahead and um, absolutely no. The just a that that first company, if you could agree, oh, okay, G R E E, is that the correct? Yeah. Okay, correct. Gree and Mydea are both pretty large companies that sell a lot of different products, largely in the China market and the Asia market. Um, and then one last one. Uh, we were chatting about this ahead of time. Does anyone make a unit design for horizontally sl sliding windows? Not yet. The really the low hanging fruit, if you will, would probably be the the sash window design, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But I I can't imagine if if these aren't if these are successful, there'll there'll be other designs and other layouts that'll come. Any other questions? I think we can get to the rest uh, later. Okay, so we did some research that kind of wrapped up in early 2023, just on some of the stuff in which we. We, we really want to under the, understand the customer experience. So this is really not about performance. It's sort of like, what are these things and what are people going to think about them and how would they use them? And just to understand a little bit about the installation practices, any noise or mechanical limitations that would impact the customer experience. So that's a little bit of what I'm going to share with you. Um, and also like, does it require a change in user behavior or would it, or what would be the impact? We did a... Uh, what we call a product council presentation for the region back on August 1st. It's available on the NIA website. Just look for product council and you can find a recording of that presentation. It's more technical and more kind of report focused than what I'm gonna cover though. And you can see here's a picture of one of the Grady units and we hooked up a data logger to it, both, um, temperature as well as power consumption, mostly just to see how it was used. And the little graph down there sort of shows you operational hours. So in phase one, it was mostly sort of an online uh, moderated uh, interviews essentially, in which it was really designed to sort of like present to consumers, if you had a product that did both heating and cooling and you could install it yourself, what would you think about it? And just to understand where um, customers are in terms of understanding. And what came out of that first phase was, was pretty favorable. In phase two, we actually put 13 units in the field, um, five the saddlebag, four window heat pumps, and four portables. And the window heat pumps and the portables are current, not cold climate, current design products. Um, and the saddlebag is, I would call it first generation, moderate mild climate, it will handle colder. And so what we got from that was a lot more kind of physical experience around what did, what, what did people think of these things as they were installing them? And I'm going to cover a little bit of the outcome of that. So in phase one, it was interesting. Energy and comfort was really top priority. This is a, what, at least what people said that was a priority. But what we found in phase two is once you've bought it and installed it, efficiency wasn't what people were after. It was comfort. So what, what people say and what they actually end up implementing, it might be a little different. Um, another thing was that people already are very used to having multiple products in their homes that do heating, cooling. Could be little space heaters, could be wood. They're 
this is not an un, this is not something that's um altogether new and and um without precedent which i thought was pretty affirming of kind of like i think this product could have a have a opportunity i think the most compelling thing in phase 1 is that 72% completely agreed that it was the concept at least of dual heating and cooling window unit was appealing and this um, when you look at kind of this similar kind of initial product reaction descriptions, the research team um, from C plus C, they said this is typical values for what they look for to help companies go after product niches. They're looking for values in the 30s. 30%, 35% would be considered very strong. 72% of an appealing opportunity is way outside of kind of what they typically see. So. There's a, it's an, I guess all I can say about it is it, it, it struck people as like, that would be cool. I wouldn't mind having one. Of course, we, we didn't describe the price or any other attributes. It was really just the concept. Um, the other really key thing was portability and 120 volt outlet. I've, um, in conversations with, um, one of the manufacturers, they said one of the strongest things they found in their initial product launches is the fact that they don't have to call multiple contractors and get a bid. This is something that they can avoid the contractor interface, which I never really thought of as a barrier, but maybe maybe there's some real value in just like, I can go buy it, do it myself, and I'm willing to pay a premium just for not having to deal with all the burden of that. And you know, the likely intended use of these will be for comfort in rooms that are not currently well served or underserved by their existing heating or cooling systems. So that's phase one. In phase two, we learned that, you know, most participants are at least somewhat satisfied with the products, you know, how it was to install overall heating performance, noise. Um, you know, they're physically pretty large. They're um, in order to have a unit that's capable of doing decent cool weather like the gradient or the other saddlebag designs, it's going to be 70, 80, 90 pounds of equipment. Um, but the way the designs of these have been done so far, it's a relatively easy um, install. In fact, people found them easier in some respects than the window air conditioner because you with the window air conditioner, it's sitting up on the lip of your window. And it's for some of them, they're required to screw screws into the frame of the window because it's not relying on like a saddlebag to hold it in place. And it didn't always work for people in apartment buildings that may not have, I don't know, the apartment building wouldn't allow them to put screws into their walls and the like. The windows worked well. Um, you know, we found that without guidance, a lot of people didn't use them much for heating. They mostly used from cooling. And that raises a key kind of like realization that they might be thinking it'd be nice to do heating, but you've realized that they already have a heating system in their house. And now you've introduced another competing heating system. How do you make sure that the more efficient one is used? not the existing one because the existing heating system might be much more powerful whole home and so you end up with um if you don't set the thermostats right or you don't prioritize the heat pump the whole house system might be the one that's used and you just spent a lot of money on a, essentially a fancy air conditioner Lastly, one of the real potential deal breakers was this idea that it will only operate to 41 degrees Fahrenheit um, was a pretty much a deal killer. Like that just became too much of a, is it too cold to run my heat pump? Am I, should I turn it off now? And it would automatically turn off. That wasn't the barrier, but it created angst and anxiety for the customers that were involved. Um, of course, aesthetics, physical barriers, noise level. Some of those were triggered in just one or two of the 13 we put in the field. And I'll give an example. Um, the, uh, people who did the, one of the window, window unit installs, once they got it in, they realized, you know, it, it just doesn't look 
doesn't create curb appeal for my house. I don't think I want to have a window air conditioner hanging out in front of my house. And so some of these things need to be more aesthetically placed or they, they might not want to have it on the front face of their building. Physical barriers, we saw a couple where might be as simple as the rose bushes underneath the window are too tall. Or if you're on the second floor, the second floor window might be too close to the roof below it. There might be some roof, uh, like a shed roof or something. And so you can't physically hang the saddlebag design over the window. And these sorts of things are things that if you were in a retail environment or buying online, you might not really physically get, how is this going to work on my house? So there's a, there's, there's a bit of learning here. It's not just stick it in the window. There might be some level of consumer awareness building, uh, education that's needed to really make sure that people are satisfied. And Christopher, on the noise level, we did get a question on that. Yeah, you know, yeah. Do you, was there a general decibel rating for the for the units? How how loud were they? They're not very loud. Um, I'd say that um, the classic window air conditioner shape ones were the ones that we saw some noise response to. But you know, they can be about the same, you know, thirty eight, forty dB um, range, kind of like a a dishwasher. Um, you know, there are certainly products out there that are air window air conditioners that are a lot louder. Um, these, uh, saddlebag designs are, um, both the ones I've seen so far have very quiet indoor noise outdoor. It's going to be a little louder as a bigger fan, but indoor it's very close to, um, li library level quiet. Um, it's a that's high, part of the that's priority. part of the attraction of those saddlebags is that you've got a big chunk of the mechanics is actually yeah, outside your home and on the other side of the window at least so that's taking up less space inside but also the noise that's that's a good deal and then the condens condensate management which we'll talk about I'm sure in the future is another advantage of that I guess yeah Brian that's a really good point when you're when you're able to close the window down mostly you still maintain the visibility as well as you've blocked out almost all the exterior noise generated by the compressor. And the compressor is sort of the source of the, the low frequency hum. Um, and the fans themselves, they're, you know, very quiet scroll uh, type fans, scroll wheel type fans. Um, you know, the challenges that I see really is that they're not advertised as, as heat pumps. <laughs> Even if they were, would consumers know what a heat pump is? Not always, really. Um, and it, as Brian pointed out, when these things operate, they frequently generate condensate water. And there's sort of two ways that happens. One is during air conditioning mode where it's um, condensing, literally condensing moisture out of your indoor air. And you got to get rid of that. The other one is in a heat pump mode when it's in heating. The outdoor coil is so cold, trying to suck heat out of cold air, that it can generate frost on the outside. And you might have seen this in heat pumps. They get kind of frosty on the outside. And every now and then, they have to melt that frost off. That water that's melted off has to go somewhere. And if it's just going down onto the rose bushes, no problem. But if you're on a third floor of an apartment building, you don't want to have those dribbling down generating icicles or splashing water onto a sidewalk. So one of the most important details of these cold climate saddlebag design is they're trying to figure out how to deal with this uh, defrost melt water. And both of them have come up with innovative solutions. I've seen them idea one, they're going to be atomizing the water. So as the condensate melts off the outdoor coil, Every now and you have to you have to defrost the outside coil. They're going to pump that through an uh, like a spray nozzle under high pressure and just blow out a fog. Um, and we're going to see how well that works, but it certainly won't generate the same kind of like dribbly rain kind of coming down below to the second and first floor of a multi-floor mm -hmm. apartment building. So that's pretty cool. Um, yep. Christopher, can I just jump in that on that yeah. thing? Because we could, that was one of the things we looked at really carefully with the portables and that's what I'm most familiar with. And 
there what you see is that you know some of the units have uh, reservoirs where it collects the condensate and then you have to the unit will automatically shut off when the reservoir gets full and you have to empty it but you might be doing that every couple of hours which is pretty inconvenient so there are other units that have onboard pumps and little hose and then will pump the water to either a, a bucket or a drain or you can have it go out your window which is what we did in our home and so I think when you're looking at these units and we have some information on that with the portables, you really want one that's got a, uh, an onboard pump, but the window units, you know, they don't have that issue, right? Is that, that's correct because the, the content state is going to go outside anyway. It's not going to come into your home. So they were, it, it's, but as you no, mentioned, depending on, on if it's a high rise building, it might be dripping water on somebody else. If it's, if it's in your single story home or something like that, that's going to be less of an issue. Yeah, there's, you know, when you're talking about condensate that's appearing when it's 45 degrees out, no problem. It's still going to stay water. But what happens when it's five degrees outside? That meltwater will become ice. And so one of the problems with doing a, a drain, uh, like a little condensate hose, is it's going to be exposed to the outdoors and it'll freeze up. So you really can't operate those portables currently. There's not a good technical solution for those to do what I would call cold climate heating. They'll work when it's mild out, when it's 40, 45, right. 50 degrees out. But below a threshold, you know, pretty quickly, you're going to end up with a frozen hose. So I believe the, the, uh, the GREE unit has got a couple of solutions, but they're not using the atomization. They're, do, they're doing a combination of reservoir and um, essentially putting some of that meltwater onto the hot coil and vaporizing it into the room. Um, and so it would, in the wintertime, potentially raise the indoor humidity a little bit, which for most of our climate here in the Northwest, that's not a bad deal. For most of the places in the heating season, you can end up with too dry of air. So a little bit of moisture in the air can help reduce, you know, nosebleeds and other things that happen when you get super dried out air. We're going to see, we're going to, we're going to need to see how those operate and, and, and see how well consumers adapt to them. But all the companies are trying to figure out how do we get and how do we deal with defrost and meltwater? And there's some really innovative um, solutions being proposed. Um, you know, the, the the other challenge here, the fourth one on this list is heat from existing sources. And I kind of mentioned that. Um, it's, it's not uncommon to have, you know, your unit being operated at the same time, your whole house, or maybe you got a space heater or baseboard. That is going to communicating that that this this window heat pump is twice as efficient as that electric heater, and when and how do you operate that? I think is a is is a challenge we need to kind of it's more of a consumer awareness challenge. Um, the size and weight these are going to be bigger. They are they are because they're more efficient. They use much bigger heat exchangers. Their compressors and such really aren't any bigger, but they're going to use bigger surface areas. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is that the current design of the saddlebag design, you got to have a sash window, you know, a single or double hung, lift the window vertically up and has to be 24 inches wide. Can't be a little teeny narrow window. Most sash windows are that wide though. Um, so there's some physical shape and size limitations that, that uh, you know, it's not a, it's not like a toaster where you kind of know what you're going to get. You can just click on it and it'll arrive and you know quite what it is. This is, how does this kind of fit on my house and how's it going to look? So that's some of the stuff we're going to be addressing. I just put this together, sort of a pros and cons and, and kind of comparing it a little bit to the sort of um, the other, other thing on the list, which is the ductless. Um, I won't dwell into all this all that much, but I think really important to point out is that the, uh, the window portable and cold climate saddlebag design, these are all products that you can take with you. So if you're in a rental situation, um, or if you're in just a temporary in a house, you can, you can take them with you when you leave. And I think that's, that's a really interesting value proposition. That's distinctly different than, than the ductless, um, 
but uh, fundamentally what we're trying to get to, and I think it's the really most exciting of all this is getting something that is essentially the value proposition of a ductless can be DIY and is lower cost. It's going to have a limited, a, a little more limited operation because if it's, you got to have sash windows. But um, I think that if it's successful, we'll see other manufacturers trying other variants of the sort of DIY physical layout. And I think that's, that's exciting to me. To, I finally see innovation in a space that's been pretty stagnant. Um, you know, getting the appropriate application, just some really simple things, you know, an electric heated home. If you have baseboard electric furnace, it's a great application. If you have single room with a, a comfort issue, it could be in a multifamily or low and moderate income, they could be pretty high value. Or homes without any air conditioning, this could provide a little bit of heating, a little bit of cooling. And I just sort of point out this picture on the right here. Here's where you've got this uh, gradient unit. And it's right next to what somebody else plugged in, which was one of these oil-filled electric heaters. This house ended up tripping the breaker nonstop, like every day, multiple times, because it had too much load on that circuit. Each one of those basically uses the full capacity of that breaker. So you can't put these things on circuits with already existing large loads. Or if you put it on the same the same load, the same circuit as a, uh, I don't know, hair dryer or toaster or microwave oven, even though they're both plugged into walls, if they happen to operate at the same time, pretty good odds you're going to go beyond the 15 amp limit of your household circuit. And it'll turn off. And I thought it'd be fun to kind of just show you an example of kind of like how this might fit in a home. Just an example, not, a, not every home, it's gonna make sense, but if you had a home with a pretty open floor plan and you wanted to sort of find a heating cooling solution, what you might think of is like, put the ductless heat pump in the main living area. And the reason why I would put a ductless is you can have a little more capacity, it's a little more efficient, um, and you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, that's, those are the principal two reasons. Um, you don't have to have a window either. It doesn't have to take up a window. Whereas the, the, the window heat pumps, you could put them in a window in say the master bedroom and maybe a, a perimeter room. And the interesting thing is by just doing these three heat pumps, you don't really need a heat pump to be put in the other bedrooms because there's going to be heating and cooling throughout the building space. And you probably can just get away with a little bit of cooling, maybe some electric heaters in the walk-in closet, the bedrooms that are inside. And you end up with a, a heating and cooling solution that is considerably less expensive than um, doing a multi-head ductless or completely replacing your whole system. I think this is a pretty interesting way of kind of stepping into um, efficiency one step at a time. Maybe do the ductless first, add a window heat pump later, add another. That's a real intriguing way of, um, yeah, putting the barrier, the cost barrier to entry a lot lower. All right, some tricks to get the most value out of these things. Number one is sort of like, turn down the thermostat of your existing room heating so that so that it it, um, it doesn't compete against the window heat pump so if you've got if you've got your existing whole home electric furnace or something just turn it down a couple of degrees or turn up the the micro heat pump up in temperature and it will be the first one used it'll deliver the most if they both sit at the same thermostat the big one will win and the big one will be your electric heater and it's half the efficiency. The other thing we found is that not to use the auto mode to set it to heat or cool, but don't set it to auto. And, and this little graph down here, my, my unhappy face is where someone, we didn't tell them how to use these things. We just let see what happened. And a person who left it on auto mode, it would, it literally ran heating and cooling and heating and cooling and heating and cooling. 
So they didn't get any heating particularly because <laughs> it was delivering cold air half the time and warm air half the time. Um, it ended up just uh, being a, a room noisemaker. So Chris person... Burr, uh, it would be like set to 70 degrees and the, and the heat pump would get it to 71 and then it would go into AC mode and get it back to seven, or 69 and then it would, okay. So, yep, I'm that's recording. exactly right. It would it would sort of do this trying to optimize, trying to to ask what you wanted it to do, and it might have been that it was interacting with the existing baseboard heaters or something like that. Um, so, a pretty interesting learning is that um, we assume, I think, as uh, customers, that automatic means that it's it's smart enough to control. It's, it's smarter than I am. In reality, not necessarily. If you try to heat a room, just set it on heat. And when I've looked at kind of, you know, what people commonly do, most people leave their whole house heating system on in heating mode until March, April, May, and then they switch it over to cooling at some point where they get a couple of days of really hot, but they don't set it to auto. So for the most part, People kind of intuit this this nature, but when you get a product that's a little um, window unit, it has a thing that says auto. I'm not sure if people are aware that you still want to leave it on heating or cooling to get the most out of it. The third thing here is that um, because these are variable speed machines, they do not have like the horsepower, the really large capacity to recover if it gets too cold or to cool down quickly or to heat up quickly, it's best just to leave them at uh, a limited amount of setback. So when you're out of the room, don't have the thermostat set so it goes really cool. Or when you're out of the room and in the, in the heating and the cooling season, don't set the thermostat really high. Just have it lope along on just whatever the target temperature is, maybe set back a couple of degrees if you like it a little cooler at night. Or if you're not in the in the room when it's you know summer and you're not going to be around for several hours, let the room temperature rise by three or four degrees. It's only when you're going to be gone for 24 hours or more should you really set the temperature differently. Does that make sense for folks? Do anybody have any question about that? Because I think that's a pretty valuable. Point. Yeah, it's, I mean we can apply that to all heat pumps too, right? That advice. Yeah. It, a lot of this is is just that it's it's you can apply this to ductless exactly um so next i'm going to pivot but i'll pause here for a moment to see if there are any kind of questions about those topics about what we learned in the field Chris, might, there's, yeah, there's some ahead. questions about the um okay so first of all i think it's important just to re reiterate there are units available now that will operate down to 40, 40 degrees or so and then there's this new generation of cold climate ones coming the ones that are available now, I, I'm, I'm always a little confused about the gradient. Is there a gradient unit that will operate to 40 degrees available today, or are they, or is it just no? They're just they're all in on the, the saddlebag for um, for a cold climate. Yeah, I what I'm aware of is that they have products that'll go down below 17 degrees, but not all the way down to five. Hmm. But they're and, not being sold yet. I mean, you couldn't buy one today, isn't that correct? Um, they are selling them through um, a limited distribution. Okay. And they're principally working with multifamily applications, but the real target is to shift their product line and their approach to a cold climate capable all the way. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, okay. But their first foray, foray into the marketplace, they've been in the market for a couple of years, is the 17 degree um, or maybe even a little cooler heating mode, it does defrost, it does all the things we were after. It's really innovative design um, and kind of set the benchmark that these others are trying to catch up to. Yeah, that's great. So the units that, that will only work to 40 degrees or so, um, one of the questions we had, well, do they just shut off at 40 degrees or what happens at 40 degrees? Yep, they will stop heating at 40 degrees. So you... Yeah. So you will just notice there's no warm air coming out of them, right? They don't actually shut themselves off automatically, do they? No, they will. They'll shut themselves off because oh, they, they can't They can't go colder than that. Um, and the reason it fundamentally is if they go colder than that, if the outdoor air gets below 40 or 41, I, 
some of them are a little different. That outdoor coil will start to frost up, mm. and it'll look like a snowball, and they don't have the onboard capability Frost. of melting that ice off there. So they will just simply, rather than risk building up an ice ball, and I mean, you probably have seen this in your refrigerator. Some of the old non-auto defrosting refrigerators or freezers, you open up the freezer and there's ice all around the door. Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing. You're condensing warm air and it's causing a layer of frost. If you don't have a way, if the technology doesn't have a way of melting that water, it's just going to build up and up and up. So um, it's a really important technological step that Gradient has led the the market and is figuring out how to deal with this defrost in a residential window style heat pump. We've had them on all the other heat pumps for a long, long time, but they're just melting their water onto the ground. Who cares? This well, is a little trickier. On that note, Christopher, it, uh, stopping at 41 degrees, uh, someone was asking is, do any of them have a electric resistance heat backup that then kicks in? Um, for the window unit or did they just stop working completely? Great question. What I have seen so far is that you either have an electric resistance heater or you have a, you know, a reverse cycle heat pump. Generally they're not both. Okay. It's possible. I, I don't know all the products on the market. Um, and when you're out there shopping for one of these things, it'll say air conditioner with heat is really different than air conditioner with heat pump. Because with heat means probably electric resistance. With heat pump means it's going to use a refrigeration cycle to move the heat. Um, and there's no real common language in the marketplace for how do you evaluate how efficient it is or does it do a good job or does it defrost? All that has to be established as segue to how do you get a rating and how do you get a tax credit? You can't give a tax credit to something until we actually have a rating that says it's actually going to deliver performance. So before I dive into that next topic, though, as eager as I am, are there any other questions from the earlier stuff? Maybe I'll ask one quick one. Someone was asking about snow buildup uh, on the units and if that's an issue. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think with all of these, the, the risk is could they handle snow kind of like a standard air standard heat pump you don't want snow piling up on top of them the saddlebag design probably is under the window eaves even if it's not the um snow piling up on top of that ledge that sticks out of the window wouldn't interfere with the vertical sides of it and as long as it's not the snow isn't so deep that it's like burying all the way up to the windowsill you should be okay. But you do need airflow across the outdoor unit. So got to keep it free of snow. Good point. All right, let's talk a little bit about what's the next step here. And that's just sort of like, before we start really getting utilities and cities and other people really chasing after these, it would be good to have a way of differentiating them and pointing them out. And the question is, well, can we get a tax credit for them? And the answer is technically, yes, the Inflation Reduction Act offers a 30% tax credit for heat pumps identified by the Consortium for Energy Efficiency, CEE. And CEE is a um, consortium of utility programs principally, but they need uh, a heating performance rating and a database of available products before they can even say this one's meeting some threshold and this one's not. We don't have such heating season ratings currently. We really have um, all these window heat pumps or reverse cycle heat pumps. They're only rated as air conditioners. So we know how efficient they are in air conditioning. We have no idea how good they are in heating. And so when we look across the broad range of products, the little graphics on the left here, we see mini split, we see packaged, we see these, these vertical package variety, portables, room AC. And you look at kind of, is there a DOE test procedure for heating or is there a DOE metric? And the answer is really none for the portables and none for the room AC. And so a collaborative of a couple of utilities and efficiency programs like NIA 
and mostly the manufacturers got together and started developing um, what we think is a appropriate way of testing and as an interim test while DOE is developing their test procedure, um, an interim rating. And basically it's an adaptation of, of um, the one used for mini splits, but tailored for these room AC units. Um, the group did not decide to go after portables because there are currently no uh, portables that can do um, defrost. And it feels like until they have reached a technology solution that can actually operate when it's cold out there, we'll just focus on the ones that are really going down this path, which seems to be these window designs, the GRI, the idea, and the gradient being the first ones that are in coming to the market. So the estimated timeline, and, and I got a really caveat, guys, that things can change, but I'm giving you kind of what I'm purview to have purview to is that in 2023, these cold climate window heat pumps, these micro heat pumps that um, really will offer a, a new value proposition are, are finalizing designs, gradient being ahead of them. And DOE has actually been asked by EPA to develop an interim test procedure in parallel to essentially what the industry is proposing. So this is being wrapped up this year. 2024, there'll be products on the market, but in limited scale. And it's an opportunity for pilots or field testing, various organizations. If you have an organization, you work for an organization that wants to do a pilot or go buy a couple of these, try them out, kick the tires, find out how consumers are responding to them. Do it in 2024 before launching any program in 2025. Um, during this 2024, there'll be an interim rating developed and that uh, interim rating will be used to determine what is a tax reasonable tax credit criteria. So that in 2025, Energy Star will have a rating and a database and CE that determines the tax credit can set a rational starting point saying you got to have at least some minimum efficiency level, a target in order to qualify for federal tax credits. So I want to kind of pause here for a moment and say that if there is interest around the pilots and field testing, um, that uh, myself or Brian can get you in contact with uh, the manufacturers. Um, their limited quantities are available. Um, I think from all these manufacturers will be coming out in 2024. And, you know, in order for Energy Star and CE to really have confidence in laying out tax credits, it's going to be really valuable to have people um, try them out. I mean, we've put some in the field, we've learned a little bit, but there's a lot of, still a lot of kind of general learning kind of experience that's going to be highly valuable. And this is one of these, like as a emerging tech kind of energy solutions kind of guy, I'm constantly looking for what's the, what's the, the chasm between an innovative product and a market that knows what it is and how to, how to find it, how to buy it and where to get it. There's this little space in between that some time period of a year or two and we're going to be entering that and uh need need uh innovative programs to try out stuff a uh, quick question on the tax credit uh christopher uh, john's asking if it would be eligible for government direct pay or bulk purchasing i think so but they'll they'll likely follow the same suit they'll want an energy star rating you know any of those hero programs, the other side of the Inflation Reduction Act, the funding and the like, almost certainly will want to have some other uh, qualified products list. And that's almost certainly going to be defined by Energy Star and CEE. Yeah, it seems like there's a, this uh, the information communication part of this is definitely a challenge. I mean, it's certainly the case now, as we've mentioned, if you're shopping for one of these, you basically have to shop for air conditioner with supplemental heat, and then you have to look to see how many BTUs it, it provides in order to know whether it's a heat pump or electric resistance heat. So, it, I mean, that's a, like just a ridiculous process for someone who's not a, kind of a 
heat geek like we are. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> you, are, you, have, you already have these barriers, and I think it's going to get even more complicated once there's the potential for some of them to be cold climate and others not. So it feels like these this um, energy star rating thing could be a real way to just cut through a lot of that because if it has an energy star rating, then then that means it's going to operate in some certain way, which is going to help identify the kinds of units that we're looking for that separate them from the ones that are just basically decent air conditioners, which is what most of the market right now is kind of uh, sort of, it's, it's really focused on, on cooling, you know? So that's why most of these units, if you look at them, they don't even talk about heat that much. Um, so that's a, that's the kind of market transformation thing. It seems to me that has to happen where we have good ways of communicating the benefits of these differentiating one product from another. And, um, and then that's also important for things like tax credits so that you can make sure that people are buying things that are really energy efficient. That, that, that raises a great point, Brian. I appreciate that is that energy star currently has an energy star rating for window air conditioners. And some mm. of them are, are reverse cycle, but the energy star rating is only on the cooling. Yep. And so this, this, this next year is where energy star starts to figure out EPA specifically do we differentiate? Do we mm. even, I mean, they want to encourage people to buy. If you're only after air conditioning, they want to continue to keep a, an energy star window air conditioner. But if you want to do both, and I can't think of a situation where you wouldn't want the capability to do heating or cooling, you would need a different, different way of communicating that to consumers. Um, yeah. I know that EPA has actually proposed um, that they might only provide their brand Energy Star to heat pumps and remove that for any and all air conditioners. Because if you're going to buy an air conditioner, make it reversible and have it be a heat pump so that you get at least some heating benefit as well as cooling benefit. Um, that's probably not going to happen right away, but I think long term, I wouldn't be surprised if the EPA starts to migrate towards um, only putting their brand recognition for heat pumps and not for air conditioners. Mm. But that's that would not be great. That'd that's be great. not the I case. Mean, you, as we, you and I were talking about this earlier, the the difference in cost between a unit that's only an air conditioner and a, and one that that has this uh, heat pump mode. Typically, it's not a lot of money. It may be fifty to a hundred dollars maximum, something like that. Yeah. Um, so now, cold climate that's different, but um, for the, the the units that are available today, the difference in price is not that great. Um, the cold climate ones, though, just to just to make people just to reiterate that, you know, you're we're talking about instead of six or seven hundred bucks, we're talking about three thousand to maybe even I think gradients right now saying four thousand for their unit yep. if you wanted to put one on reserve. So it's a significant jump up, but it's also it a significant jump in terms of capability. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, thinking of these um, cold climate ones as being functionally the equivalent of a mini split ductless heat pump that's mm -hmm. 9,000 BTUs is the way to think of those. And if you want to buy a ductless heat pump and have it professionally installed in the Northwest, you're easily looking at $4,000, probably oh, yeah. six or even 7,000 if you're in a downtown urban environment um, with higher labor rates. So, they're quite competitive for what they're functionally equivalent to. I wouldn't compare them directly to window air conditioners. They're, they're, they're really quite different, yeah. but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a better value, but maybe not the same as, uh, I mean, obviously these portables are pretty intriguing. Um, there's a lot of sort of merit and I was originally a kind of a skeptic of portables, but if you get a dual hose portable, um, and if they can figure out how to deal with that defrost cycle and get rid of the condensate, I think there's a real value prop there, but it, yeah, I mean, even, you know, right now with our experience with, with trying out the portable and I've heard from people, there's some um, people in the chat who've been commenting on their good experiences with them. You know, there there's definitely a use case for these portables or window units that provide heating and cooling, even just down to 40 degrees. Because here in the Northwest, that's you're talking about, you know, that's 10 months of the year at least where this product is 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 helpful. It's going to provide cooling in the summer and some 
heating in the sh shoulder seasons and it doesn't work for those few times of the year where it's relatively cold. So there's a there's a use case for it, but it, mm -hmm. it isn't perfect, right? It's like it has this flaw that, you know, when it gets really cold, suddenly it doesn't help, doesn't work. But yeah, I, for the value for, for six or 700 bucks, they provide some amazing value, I think, if you, you know, in, in the right use cases. But I don't think they're very widely um, understood as, or even the fact that they're even available. And there's just a, it's just a little bit too hard to kind of like um, get that information and for 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 a lot of people, I think. But yeah, uh, yeah, I think that the, the analogy might be um, they might work almost all the time. They're like buying a two wheel drive. If you live, mm -hmm. if you got a two wheel mm -hmm. drive and you're not in snow country, that's great. But if you're in a lot of snow country, yeah, it's probably yeah. worth getting the four wheel drive. Work. Yeah, <laughs> there's been a couple of questions about smoke. Maybe we could yeah. address that because uh, wildfire smoke, you know, obviously that's an issue here. And people are wondering, you know, if you've got this unit that's connected to the outside, you know, either in your window or with uh, hoses, if you've got a portable unit, what's the story with wildfire smoke? Are you getting any filtration? Are you getting extra smoke being pumped into your room? Yeah. So, um, with the, the saddlebag design, um, I'm not sure which ones. I know that the gradient currently doesn't, but it might actually ultimately have the ability to bring in ventilation air as well as just doing heating and cooling. Um, and if you bring in a ventilation air, you're going to have to put a filter across that incoming air. I don't know that they've got a large enough pressure a large enough fan to drive across the MERV 13 filter because that's basically you need a pretty good filter to pull smoke particles out. Um, in general, ductless heat pumps as well as window units kind of rely on house air leakage to provide ventilation air. Um, it's not really a ventilation solution at all. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the, the short answer is kind of like with, with any of these things, things a ducted system sorry, ductless or these portable micro units, you really need uh, filtration from a different source. And, you know, like you get one of those little room air filters, you know, they're they're not that expensive, 250 bucks or so, you can get a really good one. They're very effective. Um, but these units by themselves, they're not gonna provide the filtration you need. I don't know that they they would they would make the wildfire worse unless you've got, the only situation I can think of, Chris, is if you've got a single hose portable unit, that's gonna suck air in from somewhere else. That's and right. Blowing air out of your room where it's located. So that one may bring in wildfire smoke. So I would avoid those. It's another reason not to get a single hose unit if you ask me, but would you agree with that? Yeah, I would, I mean, Unless you have some means of filtering ventilation air, mm. um, really the only other filtration system you have in a house is the human lung. It's very good at absorbing smoke and filtering out particulates. <laughs> That's a joke. Yeah. That's a joke. Don't, don't rely on that. No. <laughs> hey, Christopher, question uh, from uh, you know what's the, what size room are a lot of these you know, meant for? Yeah, if you're if you're uh, the classic sort of thinking is somewhere on the order of four to five hundred square feet um, is what a nine thousand BTU per hour unit can provide heating and cooling for, but it does depend a lot on how well insulated that space is. Um, if it's in an uninsulated home, an older home, yeah, you might not get that many square feet of really comfortable heating and cooling. If it's in an a well insulated house um it could easily do that with for four or five hundred square feet if it's in a space that's somewhat interior that might have shared walls with other parts of the building you might be able to do the heating and cooling for eight nine hundred square feet it's really how much heat is needed for that space yeah. four to five hundred square feet is a good a good rule of thumb yeah, I think Jim was commenting that he was getting 700 square feet uh, yeah, in his house. So that's great. Um, so another uh, user or participant was asking about uh, whether, and this may be long-term plans, but anything about being grid-enabled to uh, you know, uh, load shift mm -hmm. during uh, peak power times? 
you know, with, with all of these products um, that I've seen, of the three, they're going to have user interface apps that communicate. And I think the, the jury is out on what the final protocol is for communicating to HVAC equipment. Um, there's a number of them kind of all going to use the similar approaches. Um, but we're kind of at a chicken and the egg problem is that the utilities aren't asking for specific uh, grid flex demand response until there are products and products aren't being built until the utilities ask for them. And so I think in the next five years, we're going to have this sort of shake out and we'll see landing on one clear winner. And, and at that point, all products will be equipped with this sort of grid flex or grid enabled capabilities. Right. Uh, Brian, any uh, questions you're seeing? Um, no, I think uh, it might be a good time to wrap up. Um, I did want to um, remind people that we have, if you're interested, um, you know, there's uh, information that we have on our website about portable portable units. We did quite a thorough investigation of that. So um, if you, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, but basically, if you go to our website, you can find a fact sheet on portable units where we kind of give you a good breakdown of what's available today. It doesn't include these saddleback or the window units, but um, it's a good, Chris, if you're, if you stop sharing your screen for a second, I'll show people yeah. what that looks like. I'll do that. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll also add is um, if any of the participants on the call or later watching this YouTube is are interested in um, running pilots of, you know, 10, 20 units, uh, let Brian or I know. We'll put you in contact with the people, but not for small, you know, just one purchase. That's we don't have the bandwidth for that. Right. Yeah, there were a couple folks already adding information, including Multnomah County, just to buy it. So this is just a comparison of some of the portable units that are available today with their their price. You know, it might change a little bit since we did this, but I checked recently. It's not substantially different the cooling and heating BTUs and, and importantly, how many vent hoses they have and some of these other things about drain hoses and stuff. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time and I just want you to know it's there. And then these are the, the models that we thought were the ones that panned out the best com compared to their um, the rivals that were out there. So I just wanted to let people know that that information is available in case you're, um, in case you're interested. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, Joe, did you have any other uh, questions that we thought we should address? I think we covered a lot. Uh, really appreciate Christopher, you coming on the show again uh, and sharing your expertise and this technology that's going to be a real, you know, important driver of efficient uh, heat pump heating and cooling in the near future. Yeah, I'm hoping this fills that little gap in the market, somewhere between window and ductless heat pump that that can uh, really get people solutions that otherwise weren't really financially viable for them. Yeah, it's it's super it's super promising. I, I would love it if there was a three or four thousand dollar solution that people could install themselves and get you know a huge benefit of um, really quickly. It would be great. Um, it, just in case some people asked about this, we will be sending the presentation slides out to everyone who's uh, registered for the show, including the last two slides I just showed. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, tuning in today. Thank you again, Christopher. It's always great to have you on the program. And my pleasure. Uh, like, like we like to say, if um, if you have any questions about any of these electrification things, please contact us. We'll try to find you an answer and and good luck with all your electrification projects. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks, everyone. All right.